So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Alex Stromeyer from Leeds, who, who will speak on cohomology and scattering theory. Alex? Well, thank you very much for, for the invitation and uh, uh, for giving me the opportunity to report on this work. Uh, it's actually the first time that I give a talk about it, so I'd be very interested to hear some feedback. So this is uh, work that can be found on the archive, uh, also will uh, appear. Uh, so I actually forgot which journal it was. Uh, uh, probably uh, CPD, yes, exactly. Uh, but if you want to have details of this work, uh, uh, it's actually quite long, I think 50 or 60 pages. Um, so I will just explain the rough uh, structure. But if you want any details, uh, please just feel free to, to download it from the archive and take a closer look. So I'll just uh, revise a little bit and motivate what we were doing. And so let me, let me start with Hodge theory. So Hodge theory, brief reminder of Hodge theory. If you have a closed Riemannian manifold, Mg, so this is a closed manifold, and then you can consider the Laplace Beltrami operator, d delta plus delta d, uh, which is just the ordinary differential operator, uh, Laplace operator on, on functions, if p is zero, but on forms it's slightly more complicated, it still has the same uh, structure in principle. So this acts on p forms, so which I denote by omega p, of M and uh, so the kernel of this is the space of harmonic forms. So let me write it down. The space of harmonic P forms, which will be denoted by H. And this is by definition, the kernel of the Laplace operator acting on P forms. So I'll denote it like maybe like this. So we have general forms. And then I'm going to look at the kernel acting on omega P. So this is the kernel acting on P forms. And Hodge theory just says that this is uh, isomorphic to the space uh, of the RAM, the DRAM cohomology group in a canonical way, in the sense that, of course, every harmonic form is closed. And so its representative defines the cohomology class. What this means in practice is that you can, you can compute them explicitly, the dimensions at least, um, using the Meyer Viatoris sequence for any manifold concretely using just some algorithm. And that's very remarkable because it tells you that you know that the number of solutions or the, the dimension of the space of solutions of PDE can be expressed in topological terms. So spectral theory, of course, is then very interesting. What does it tell you? So spectral theory tells you that in a way, as lambda goes to infinity, we all know that dynamical information is is contained in the eigenvalues. So this basically gives you dynamics and the Hodge theory tells you that at very low energy is when lambda equals zero, uh, you've got topological information included in the spectrum of the Laplace operator, topological. And, and maybe I should recall here, but only very briefly, that there is a connection between those two and this is exactly where the index theorem um, comes from, from the fact that the index is so perturbation stable that you can go back and forth between lambda goes to infinity and lambda goes to zero. But that's not the subject of my talk, but I just want to show you that there is some interesting connection there. Okay, what about the non-compact case? So if the manifold is non-compact, there is a, a very nice example which displays what's happening in this non-compact case, and that's when the manifold has a cylindrical end. Um, so that looks like this. And it goes off to infinity, and there is some topology here. So it's MG in the manifold. I'm not going to define it. It's the definition by picture. So there is some cross section here, which is a manifold. This is M and then it's a cylinder. So a manifold with cylindrical end. And in this case, um, I haven't yet figured out how exactly to operate this board. So I'll try to do it like this. So in this case, uh, you have a lot of uh, conclusions. So one of them is that you can again look at the L2 kernel of the Laplace Beltrami operator. And so what I mean by this is you consider it on P forms, then you consider the L2 eigenfunction, uh, uh, the L2 kernel. So the functions that are in L2 and are in the kernel of, uh, of the Laplace operator. And in this case, it's not the DRAM cohomology, but it's something else. It's the image of cohomology with compact support, actually not like this, in cohomology, in total cohomology. So again, this is computable. So again, you can compute this dimension, but you can see that it's not the entire cohomology group. There is something missing. 
And what is missing is, uh, remarkably, is in the continuous spectrum. So the missing part is represented in the continuous spectrum. And I think this uh, realization was uh, first in the in the works of Atia, Pasuri, and Singer. And then it was, I think, also Werner Müller clarified the explicit nature of this. And uh, I think nowadays you can understand all this in a more general context uh, uh, by by using the B calculus. Okay. Uh, so that's interesting because you have uh, both in the continuous spectrum and in the in the in the discrete spectrum you have topologies uh, sitting, but it's very clearly separated. Um, so by by this by sort of by I didn't I was actually not very precise about what, what exactly the statement is, but so there is the image of in total cohomology, and then there is some complement, and this complement can be represented by generalized eigenfunctions. Okay, so now let me explain what our setting is. So this is a little bit different. Um, maybe I'll, I'll try to erase this here. Because I, don't, I want to keep it some, some things. So sorry, that doesn't look probably very professional. Let's separate the board here. Good, so our setting is the following. Um, I'm going to consider a manifold that is uh, Euclidean at infinity. So in other words, it looks like this. This is RD. And um, out of RD, I'll take a compact region and I'll modify this compact region. So I'll give it a bit of topology, for example, like that. Um, what I can also do is I can put uh, several sets and take them out. So in this way, so what I mean by this is you, here you have uh, obstacle number one, obstacle number two, and obstacle number three. So we have uh, a manifold X, G, which is, uh, so this is a manifold which is Euclidean outside a compact set at infinity. And then we have a number of obstacles, O1 up to a OK. So these are um, smooth boundary. So I have a smooth boundary uh, domains in X and their closure is compact. So you think of them as obstacles. And then I, if I remove them from X, sorry, that's not what I wanted to write. So if I re remove them from X, X, I get a manifold M, I denote M. So this is uh, X without all these obstacles, so O1, O2. And of course, I don't, I, I don't want them to, these obstacles are not overlapping and they are not touching. Okay, so on M, I'm going to consider now the, um, the Laplace operator on P forms again. So consider the Laplace operator, so this acts now and compactly supported. Um, or maybe I will not be precise here actually. So acts on P forms. And the reason I'm not, I don't want to be precise is because of, uh, there is a standard way to construct it. If you give boundary conditions, you can construct the self adjoint operator. And so I'm just going to write the boundary conditions. So you satisfying relative boundary condition. So what are they? Um, so if you have a P form and you restrict it to the boundary of the obstacle, you can consider the tangential component. So that's the same as pulling the, back, the form back under the uh, inclusion map. And you want this to be zero. And then you want the same to be true when you apply delta to this. So note that this is true anyway for D because D commutes with restriction. So these are relative boundary conditions. And so this corresponds to a self adjoint operator corresponding just to the quadratic form you know, of smooth functions based on smooth functions satisfying those uh, boundary conditions. And then you take the free to extension and you get a well-defined self adjoint operator. 
Um, so this is called the relative Laplacian and in, in the paper we have rel everywhere written, but I don't want to write this out all the time. So I'm going to assume throughout the talk that my Laplace operator is the relative Laplace operator. And then for the relative Laplace operator, you still have the, the harmonic P forms. So this is HP of M. So I'm looking at the kernel of the Laplace operator acting on P forms intersect with L2, or the, the L2 kernel, and then I'm restricting this to P forms. So this is the space of harmonic P forms, square integrable. Um, so this is an important space. Um, the reason why it's an important space is because, for, for example, for P equals one, this is the space where electrodynamics takes place. Uh, indeed, so if you look at, um, if you consider this U here as a one form, you can think of this as the electromagnetic potential. Um, and the electromagnetic potential with metallic boundary conditions in a certain gauge will satisfy exactly those relative boundary conditions. Okay, so obviously electromagnetism is not described by a scalar function, but by a vector value potential. And so this is well reflected in, in the formalism of uh, one forms in this case, or two forms if you want, because uh, you know the magnetic field, you can also think of that as a two form. So this, this is the appropriate language for these kind of problems. What is known about the space of uh, harmonic forms? Let me summarize this a little bit. So I think this was first proved by Gilles Caron. So let me just summarize. that when the dimension is greater or equal three, then HD is equal to zero. And HP can be computed um, of M. Namely, it's the space of uh, it's the Zeram cohomology with compact support. So you consider only compactly supported forms, um, but they need to be compactly supported away from the obstacles. So this, is, this happens in dimension um, greater than three, greater equal three. Maybe I'll keep the picture so that you remember what I'm talking about. Alex, and what um, is HD? Um, so D is the dimension, yeah. Um, and HD is the space of harmonic forms. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sorry, I just skipped the M. So this says there is no, um, there is no harmonic D form which satisfies relative boundary conditions. There is no square integrable deform there. You could actually infer this from the maximum principle. It's not very difficult. But the interesting bit here, what the theorem says is the interesting bit goes on um, for other p's. So I'll give you some examples in a second, actually. So d equals two is a bit different here. Uh, then you have uh, h1 only is the only non-trivial one. And this turns out to be h1 of m uh, relative to the boundary. So this is the space you want uh, the complex to so the cohomology of the complex that appears if you take your um, one forms to be uh, vanishing on, I mean, the norm, the tangential component to be vanishing on the obstacle, but you don't require it to have to be compactly supported. So in a way, it's, it's only supported away from the obstacle, but not uh, away from infinity. Okay, so this uh, could probably say, uh, this follows nowadays from, the, from Melrose's calculus and more generally, Generally true, and it's part of a machine that allows you to compactify spaces um, and compute cohomology of these spaces. But anyway, so in this form that I, we are using here, especially with the extra boundary, you will actually not find it. Uh, so you actually have to dig this out from from papers of Caron. So the two-dimensional case, you already have to combine various propositions and theorems. But I'm just summarizing this here. Okay, what are the interesting examples that I want to uh, explain to you? So example number one is you take R, R3 and you take out um, a couple of balls. So ball number one, ball number two, and maybe a smaller ball and another ball. So there are like, um, so okay. O1 equals a ball somewhere, and then you have n many balls, let's say. And they are centered somewhere, and they, don't, they have an arbitrary positive radius. And then in this case, the only non-trivial, the only non-trivial um, um, harmonic P form you get is in the in degree one, so the electromagnet electromagnetism in a way. 
and this is equal to r uh, n minus one. So if you have uh, one obstacle, uh, this, um, this is not interesting, but if you have two obstacle and obstacles, then this is a one dimensional space. Okay. So maybe this is not the example I want to focus on. The a more interesting example that I want to explain here a bit more is a wormhole. So you take R3 again, and you cut out two balls. And then you, you have to, of course, the boundary of that will be two spheres, and you join them by, by a cylinder like that. Okay, so this is a wormhole. Of course, you have to smoothen it out a little bit here to make it into a smooth manifold, but it doesn't, of course, change the topology of the space. And in this way, you compute what I said before, and what you what you find out is that uh, H1M is equal to R, so the one component in the first uh, degree, and then there is another one in degree two, um, this is equal to R as well. Okay. So of course, if you have several wormholes and things add up, and the, the next example, so this is example two, and then example three, you could also, so this doesn't have a boundary. Uh, now I'm going to introduce one that has a boundary, but the topologically non-trivial boundary. So I'm going to do the following, and it's the hardest one to draw. In fact, I give up drawing it, so I'm just going to schematically describe it. And maybe I'll do that in another color to disguise the fact that I'm not very good at drawing stuff. Okay, so this is a full torus. So what I do is I take R3 and I take out, um, yeah, I don't actually know what the full torus, what the mathematical symbol of a full torus is. Um, so maybe it's a torus that has a slightly different color, but it's the full torus. And I take that full torus out. So this, this corresponds basically to taking a piece of metal, which is shaped like a donut, and you, you impose metallic boundary conditions in space, and then you're looking at electromagnetism in this space. And what you find in this case is that it has exactly the same cohomology groups as the wormhole. So H1, sorry, not cohomology groups, harmonic P forms. Um, so H1 space of harmonic forms is equal to R. And the space of harmonic two forms is also equal to R. So now, what's the interpretation of this? Uh, I just say this very briefly. So, of course, lambda equals zero uh, corresponds to harmonic things, and this corresponds to zero frequency solutions of Maxwell's equations. So, in other words, we are here electrostatic. We're dealing with electrostatic solutions, and so they do actually correspond to things. Uh, for example, the H two. Um, in this in this situation here in the wormhole this corresponds to magnetic field lines field lines going through the wormhole and coming back on the other side uh, through r3 and then going back so they, they're wrapping around in the wormhole and, and so of course these these exist then and they decay and maybe from far away they look like a magnetic dipole or on the torus you can also take a you know a circular current and, and generate a magnetic field in this way but of course, these two phenomena are quite different from each other, nevertheless, so that you can't distinguish them in the space of um, harmonic forms. And, and I'm, I'm, I hope I'll be able to explain that, uh, that in fact, we have a refined and more refined theory that can actually distinguish these two spaces. Alex, and yeah. if, uh, suppose you remove a torus that is knotted, like a trefoil knot or something, uh, what, huh. will something change? I mean. Topologically, right, you have a knot complement, so it's a different story than uh, an unknot, which is the torus. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> in fact, yeah, that would be interesting to compute. Mm. Yeah, no, just... I think I think something should change, yeah, but uh, I actually have never computed the cohomology. I mean, you have to just... It's very, very easy to compute. Yeah? All you need to do is to... In fact, you can do this computation in a sphere. You just take out this torus, and then you look if something happens to the relative cohomology groups. So the, the question is, can the fundamental you group of the fundamental group of the complement will definitely be different, right? Okay. So what about the abelianization of the fundamental group? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but in yeah, any case, so if that's different. Then yeah. Yeah. 
in any yeah, case. Well, I think that, I think you're right. So one one can probably sees that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I have just haven't computed it. Good. Yeah. So that there is a difference, yeah, and that's it's, I find it quite interesting that there is some physics behind this because, in fact, it somehow asks the question: Which magnetic fields can you can you generate uh, with all kinds of metals uh, depending on their topology? Good. So let's let me explain a little bit the structure of the L2 harmonic forms. Uh, this is the structure of HP of M. And in fact, they have a very similar structure uh, as functions, but they are more interesting. So maybe I should say this, when P is equal to zero and there is an obstacle, then of course there is no, there is no eigenfunction. I mean, that just follows from, from the maximum principle. So this, this question here is actually just uh, only non-trivial when P is not zero. That's why there is actually no theory for functions, but the, the interesting bit happens only for P forms. Okay, so you choose an orthonormal basis. So choose an orthonormal basis in HP. So n before was the number of obstacles. Now it's not anymore. So n is just the dimension of the space HP. So this is an orthonormal basis in HP, the space of harmonic P forms. So we can of course choose that. So each single of them will will solve um, will be a harmonic form, and therefore by separation of variables you can you can multipole expand it at infinity. So in other words, so a uj of r theta for very large values of r. So you fix yourself a Euclidean coordinate system and you can therefore expand it with some expansion coefficients uh, in uj, one over r, so, so this just comes out of the computation, l nu plus d minus two times phi nu of theta. So as r goes to infinity. So this gives you some expansion. What's phi new? So this is um, so this is the basis of spherical harmonics. Of course, uh, vector valued spherical harmonics. Um, so they take values uh, in R R in L lambda p R D. But I'm not. I'm going to suppress this because it's clear anyway. So on S D minus one. Or maybe I'll just write it out once with values in lambda p r d and of degree l nu is the degree of the spherical harmonic, so now it's fixed. So I can expand this, and maybe I should say this already before I bore you to death with all these expansions. Um, on a compact manifold, you have harmonic forms, and there is no further information. But here you have harmonic forms, and you can actually have a, you actually have a filtration depending on how fast they they go to infinity. Okay, so and that's why I'm ex expanding this now because there may be some harmonic forms that have uh, you know where the first coefficient is zero, and this is a subspace in the space of all harmonic forms. Okay, so so if if you take a smooth function on the sphere. And again, I mean vector valued. So what you can do is you can um, you can write down the following map. You can define H A phi. So this is just the expansion coefficient when you expand it in terms of spherical harmonics. Of course, a smooth function on the sphere can be expanded in, 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 in into spherical harmonics. If you fix an orthonormal basis, you get expansion coefficients. And then you can define coefficients AKL, AKJ, sorry, L, upper L. What you do now is you take only the spherical harmonics of degree L and you expand back. So that's what I'm going to write down now. I'm sorry that this takes a bit of time write down the disadvantage of a board talk. So once you have this, you can define the canonical operator. So all this so far depends on the choice of basis, but the canonical operator that I'm going to write down now will not depend on the choice of basis. So PL will be a map which sends a harmonic P form to itself. 
for the space, sorry, which sends a harmonic P form to a harmonic P form. And it's defined as follows. So you take, you expand it, but then you're summing back only over the things that have degree L. So you can take only a k j l dot u j u k. So in particular, in particular, uh, p l is zero, p l u is zero if there is no degree contribution. And by no degree l contribution, I mean if you expand it into into spherical harmonics. So, of course, this depends on the coordinate system, but the filtration you get will, does, not, does not actually depend on the coordinate system. And this operator PL also doesn't depend on anything, so it doesn't depend on the basis you chose. So it's completely invariantly defined. Uh, this is somehow just an exercise in linear algebra. Good, so what are the results? So the first thing I would like to advertise are small, small lambda expansions in the resolvent. So uh, I'll explain a little bit later why they're important. So small lambda expansions in the resolvent. So I'll just summarize now the theorems. Uh, remember what the resolvent is maybe, I'll just briefly say this. So resolvent here for me is Laplace minus lambda squared to the minus one. And a priori, it's defined only in the resolvent set. But in fact, for this manifold, the resolvent also has a meromorphic continuation to a logarithmic cover um, of the complex plane, and in odd dimensions, even to a double cover of the complex plane. And so, and that that happens only if you consider it as a map from, um, let's say, in L2 maybe. Uh, from L2 compactly supported to L2 log. So as a map from, from there to there, uh, the resolvent actually extends analytically. So what's the theorem here? Maybe I should say first that so such expansions with potential were obtained by Kato and Jensen in a series of works uh, using resolvent expansion. So you just use perturbation theory, basically. And I want to uh, also maybe point out uh, a work by Guillaume and Hassel. Um, where they do this in, in great generality uh, using using the scattering calculus, I think, and blow ups at infinity. So that's a very original work. So what we do is a bit different. Uh, we're basically just using battle functions. Uh, so this is in the case of functions, I should say. And so for P forms, the situation is a bit different. Uh, it's, it's different in many ways. So first of all, uh, it excludes many things that can happen and can go wrong if you have a potential and if you, uh, if you have a more general end. Maybe I should write down the theorem before I, before I discuss this. Okay, theorem one is so let D be odd and greater equal three. So then uh, Laplace minus lambda squared to the minus one can be written as minus p divided by lambda squared plus i times b minus one divided by lambda plus b of lambda. So of course that doesn't mean anything unless I specify what these things are. So the first thing is that this is a holomorphic function. So this is holomorphic in lambda. And by this, I mean as an operator from L2 uh, compact to L2 log. Uh, you can actually make this much more precise, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, I don't want to. Uh, you think of it just as a distribution if you want. Uh, what's P? Well, P is what it has to be, actually. There's no other way. It has to be the, ortho the L2 orthogonal projection. So that's 
protection from L2 to HP of M, right? So this is the orthogonal projection onto the kernel. Okay, so now the point is what is B minus one? So if the dimension is equal to three, then B minus one can be computed and it's exactly P1. So this is exactly this, this operator that we had before. Actually, now I'm not sure anymore if it's one half P1, but I think, I hope I, co I, I copied it directly, I uh, copied, copied it correctly from the paper. Anyway, so it can be expressed in terms of P1. So in particular, if there are no harmonic forms that have a, an L equals one contribution in their, in their expansion, then this term is zero. And um, this is, for example, important. So a statement like this implies uh, that Laplace to the power, power minus a quarter uh, maps compactly supported functions to, to L2 functions, which is important in quantum field theory and the quantization of the electromagnetic field. And that's actually how I got to the, these questions. So the good news is that if you don't have a boundary and no obstacles, then B minus one is actually zero. Um, and if the dimension is greater equal three, sorry, greater equal five, then B minus one is actually zero. So that's the first result. And the second result is in odd dimension, is in even dimensions where things are more complicated. Um, so you know, the other theorem is that suppose that D is even and greater equal four. So then the resolvent R lambda can be written as, well, minus P divided by lambda squared. That's of course always the same. But now the next term is not one over lambda. In fact, it turns out that there can only be even powers of lambda in an expansion. Um, but uh, it's not holomorphic. So there is a B minus one now in front of a minus uh, of a log term. So it's still singular, but the reason is different and then plus B of lambda. Now what's, um, what's B of lambda? B of lambda is also not holomorphic. So this here is going to be holomorphic in some modified sense. Namely, it's Hahn holomorphic. And I don't know if you've seen me talk about this subject. So this is actually a notion that I introduced a while ago um, with Jörn Müller. And so this is myself and Jörn Müller introduced this notion of Hahn holomorphic functions. This is just basically the same thing as a holomorphic function, but you allow powers of log to appear. And the statement is here is not only that such an expansion exists, so you have to be a little bit careful allowing powers of log because they can be some funny phenomena. Uh, but the point is that it also implies that the series converges. Okay, so this, this has a convergent expansion in terms of log and even powers of lambda. And uh, now maybe I should explain what B minus one in this case is. So if the dimension is four, then uh, B minus one, this expansion coefficient is a quarter times P one. And if the dimension is greater for, then B minus one is zero. Okay, so these are not zero resonance states. These are L2 eigenfunctions, which, which should still show up in the resolvent in a non-trivial way. So if you want, so if you have, um, Usually, and that's the case in the, if you have a cylindrical end, for example, or even a hyperbolic end, it's quite usual that you have the discrete spectrum. Maybe I do it in blue here. So this is usually the discrete spectral part. And then the funny thing is you would, if you were very naive, you would expect that the other part, which is only the continuous part of the spectrum, doesn't see anything of the L2 eigenfunctions, but that's not right. So this still contains, so this, there are still traces of L2 eigenvalues in there. And that's quite surprising. And I think that's exactly what uh, Katsu and Jensen's uh, first remark, because naively you would think that they are not there. Good. So if you have an expansion of the resolvent, you automatically get expansions of all kinds of things. In particular, you can write down expansions of generalized eigenfunctions, which form the continuous spectrum. And there are a lot of them. So if you open our paper, and that's also part of the reason why it's long, we have a, a lot of 
expansions of generalized eigenfunctions. And I, I probably don't want to explain. I want to spare them because you can in principle look them up uh, anyway. But I mean, the main point here is that the expansion of generalized eigenfunctions at lambda equals zero also contain uh, harmonic forms and therefore topological information of the manifold. Okay. Good. So I would like to just give you an example of how this can be used. And uh, it can be used in scattering theory. So let me explain this. Um, so the continuous spectrum, a little bit explained. In this case, can be very explicitly described. Uh, well, what's the continuous spectrum, which starts at zero. So you, you have the point spectrum. Oh, no, I shouldn't have called it HP. Well, <laughs> the point spectrum is, is actually, in this case, it's uh, really HP, but the P has a different meaning. And then we have the continuous spectrum starting from zero here. So let me describe it. So this continuous spectrum does not have multiplicity one. In fact, it has a multiplicity infinite and it's parameterized by L, by L2 functions on the sphere, uh, which will be clear in a second after I write down what this means. So given the function on the sphere, uh, let's take a smooth function on S T minus one, taking values in lambda P, this P form valued function. So there is a unique E lambda of phi, which I call the generalized eigenfunction. Um, so for lambda greater zero here is unique. Uh, such that the following is true. So you have uh, Laplace minus lambda squared E lambda phi equals zero. So it satisfies the equation. So it satisfies relative boundary conditions. I should have said this in the beginning, but I forgot. So in the in the case of functions when p equals zero, then the relative boundary conditions correspond to Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, in for general p, they are not uh, because so they correspond to tangentially imposed um, Dirichlet boundary conditions and normally imposed Neumann boundary conditions. Okay, so these these functions exist and they have an they have an expansion. So they are also characterized by this property here that as r goes to infinity, just before I forget it, I'll write it down now, you have an expansion of this form e to the minus i lambda r divided by r to the power d minus one over two. So that's called the incoming spherical wave. Fortunately, there is another factor here, i to the d minus one over two, and then there is phi. So that's an incoming spherical wave. And then together with it, there is an outgoing spherical wave which is e to the i lambda r divided by r to the d minus one over two again, times minus i, that unfortunate factor. And then psi lambda plus o of one over r to the d plus one over two. So this is the leading term. So in fact, you can write, you can say much more. You can actually write it down in terms of a Hankel function and a Bessel function, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, and so the point is this, you fix your function phi, this is the incoming wave, and then the outgoing spherical wave determines uniquely another function psi lambda. So this is, uh, then determines the map. So the map is called the scattering matrix. So this is the map S lambda, which sends smooth functions on the sphere. Maybe I'll skip the lambda d components here. So send smooth functions on the sphere, the smooth functions on the sphere by sending phi to psi lambda. What are its properties? So this function as lambda is meromorphic on a logarithmic cover of the complex plane. In fact, it's Han meromorphic at zero. That's what we were able to show. So it has a, a, a complete, as it has a convergent expansion into in the generalized power series. And it has a very specific form, namely S lambda is of the form identity 
plus a lambda. This is called the scattering amplitude. And this is actually a trace class operator. It's much, much more than that. In fact, it's a smoothing operator. Where lambda is, no, it's even more than that. It's uh, analyticizing, if that is a word. I don't know if that exists, actually. So it, it turns any distribution into, into an entire function. Where lambda is as nice as it can possibly be. No, that's not true. I mean, if it was turning it into a polynomial, it's probably even nicer, but it's, it's probably a bit too far. So it's smoothing. Let's just write it down. In particular, it's trace class. It also can be differentiated and so on. So what is all this good for? Um, what I have here is this can be used um, for trace formula, and that's exactly what uh, what I'm, I want to describe now. So I need a little bit of notation. Um, the Beerman kind formula is one application that I want to point out here. There are many others, of course. For instance, if you want to investigate uh, things like that are called Price Law, uh, wave decay on such manifolds, then the low energy components of the resolvents determine exactly how fast the solutions of the wave equation or the Schrodinger equation decay uh, when time goes to infinity. And that's, of course, important for nonlinear problems. But let me remind you of the Birman Klein formula. So what I want to do is I, I have these two situations that I want to compare. I have flat space uh, RD, and I want to compare this space uh, with the one that we have, so with the, uh, the topology and obstacles inside. So this is our manifold M. And of course, that's not the same Hilbert space, so I can't really compare them. Uh, but in fact, there is a, a very simple way to do it anyway um, in scattering theory. Very simple formalism, namely you cut out the sphere here, and then you cut out the same sphere here. And so the outside of both regions are actually uh, comparable. So the red bits here are the same, yeah. You can see the red bits. And you take, uh, maybe call um, P is the indicator function of the red bit. I don't know how to say this. So P projects onto the red L2, <laughs> and here it's P0 does the same, okay. I hope that's clear. Um, so P is just the multiplication by the indicator function of this red region, and you can of course localize uh, things uh, to take place in these regions. And so uh, what you can do is you can cut and paste so the exterior of the regions and the interiors of the regions, and, and then you can actually compare things. So I want to explain now the beerman klein formula. So suppose that we have an even smooth function, so f is in C naught infinity of R, and it's even, so f of x equals f of minus x. So then, you can look at the following traces, so we can uh, consider the following um, function. You take f of Laplace of the Laplace operator sorry, to the power of one half. So that you see even means just the, as a function of, of the Laplace, it's a smooth function. Uh, so that's something that acts on m. And now I'm, I'm projecting it to the compact part of m so by taking one minus p. And then I can the take the trace of that, right? So that's uh, the trace in in L2 of the compact part. Strictly speaking, I would I would need, of course, a, uh, maybe I'll do that, sorry. So I will take a trace of one minus P, F of Laplace to the power one half, and then one minus P here as well. But of course, under the trace, you can also move it to the other side. So it's a bit sloppy here. So I want to compare that with the compact part of, of the Euclidean bits, which is one minus P naught, times f of Laplace zero to the power one half, one minus P naught. So what is Laplace naught? Well, it's just the Laplace operator on P forms, but on RD. Yeah, so these are the two operators I want to compare. So here I compared them separately on the compact bits. So that's why I consider the operators first, and then they take their trace, so then I can take the difference. So 
But on the outside red region, I can actually take the difference of the operators and then take the trace. So plus the trace of T of F Laplace to the power one half. In fact, I have to because the individual operators are not trace clouds. But the difference is, and so that's, um, that's what we consider here. So it measures the difference of the, of the, of the two, of basically the, that's somehow the difference of the traces. But I had to do the splitting because they, 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 they act on different Hilbert spaces. Yeah, so that's the difference of the traces of the two operators. And what's that? Well, in one case, we have no P forms that are harmonic. And in the other case, they are. So of course you, you get the dimension of HP. But then you also get a, a non-trivial contribution from the fact that the continuous spectra are different. And that's the famous Biermann-Grein contribution is where the scattering phase comes in. So that's Biermann-Grein formula. It's just this one over two pi i times the integral from zero to infinity. So we actually proved that in the paper of p-forms with zero being somehow an unpleasant bit. It um, has been looked at um, for functions definitely. I think also in the case of forms um, by Christiansen uh, and also Leonid, I think, has a paper on, on the Weil law in a quite general context, actually. So F of lambda, and then you take the trace of S lambda star, and you take the derivative of S of lambda. S of lambda is the scattering matrix. And that's nicely trace class because if you take the derivative, the one goes away, and you only get the derivative of the nice A lambda, which is a trace class operator. So that's only true if the dimension is greater or equal three. There is a more complicated formula, which depends whether or not you have obstacles in dimension two, but I don't want to write it down because it becomes very messy. Uh, yeah, I should probably say this, uh, that also in dimension two, there are resolvent expansions that are very messy. So in fact, they take up several pages and I will spare you those. But if you're interested in dimension two, please take a look. It's a very interesting special case. The dimension two is quite different from the other dimensions. Good, so that implicitly defines actually the spectral shift function. So this, this integral, if you can actually integrate by parts formally here, so let's write this down maybe. So this is basically one over two pi i, as far as I remember, integration by parts uh, means that there is a minus here. And then you have f dash of lambda and then this is the famous, famous spectral shift function here, which is defined in this way. But I've chosen the wrong spectral parameter because of lambda squared is actually the spectral parameter and not lambda. Let me make a tilde on this. So the spectral shift function in the original parameterization is the function that describes this spectral shift. So this in red here, spectral shift. That describes uh, the spectral shift and the spectral shift function. Let me just explain it here in, in the other spectral parameterization in which it is more classical. So the spectral shift function is a function of mu. I'm sorry for that. I think a normal spectral geometry would call this lambda and not mu, but I've already used lambda. So this is one over two pi i times integral from zero. And here comes uh, instead of lambda, I'll take uh, square root of lambda. So this is where the reparameterization comes back. And then I take trace of s lambda star s lambda dash. So I'm just taking a primitive of, of this function so that I can integrate by parts. So if I define it like this, if mu is greater zero and I define it to be zero, if mu is smaller zero, smaller equal zero. So in this way, uh, the spectral shift function gets defined everywhere. And of course it shouldn't be, um, it can be zero only on where the spectrum is and the spectrum starts at zero, hence this jump here. So the jump of the spectral shift function is interesting. And by the way, uh, maybe I should say that you can also be written as one over two pi i uh, log that if you define this appropriately. So that, that's the Fredholm determinant. So because the scattering matrix is of the form one plus uh, trace class operator, it has a determinant. And so this is one over square root of mu. The, the scattering matrix is the scattering phase, so log that of S of square root of mu. And this scattering phase is, is a very interesting object. So if, if mu is greater than zero, then this is given by this formula. And so the jump at zero is actually given by, in this case by, by the uh, dimension of the space of harmonic forms. 
and this was uh, the jump was a already computed by Caron. And here we are a bit more general. So let me maybe explain this here. What our theorem is in this case, so using all this expansion. So anyway, what I'm writing down now is, not, is, is a corollary of, 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 of all the expansions we have. But I had to pick out one, as you can see, I've already almost spent an hour. Um, so I, I had to pick out one application. And that's, uh, I think it's going to, for me, is a very interesting one. So again, uh, this can be done in, um, in dimension two as well, in which it becomes enormously complicated. So I'll restrict myself to dimension three. So if the dimension is great, sorry, dimension greater equal three, um, then the, mention, the, the spectral shift function actually has an expansion of this form. So it's the, uh, the Betty number, in other words, the dimension of um, space of harmonic forms, P. So it can be computed using the Maya Viatori sequence. Um, so P uh, equals one. Oh no, where is it comes later? So plus, uh, now there is another, there is the next term in the expansion, alpha P times mu to the power d minus two over two plus, and then there is an error. So the error is, so the order is d minus one over two if d is odd. And it's one over log mu if d is even. And so what can we say about this coefficient alpha p? So this coefficient is equal to uh, in case uh, p equals one or p equals zero. So functions are one forms. And so that's maybe, I should also say that if you are not interested in one forms, only in functions, the interesting bit is that there is a connection between them. So in fact, the theory about one forms gives you information about the theory on functions. So that's alpha p in this case is minus two to the power one minus d d squared divided by gamma with the gamma function d minus two over two squared. And then the trace of P1. And P1, remember, uh, is that that operator that we constructed from this, this filtration um, into degrees. And um, so that, that gives you an, a nice application of this formula so that's application number one and application number two is the fill, um, HP to another application. Application number two is that um, so the space of harmonic forms HPM, remember has a filtration, so it's filtered. And the following way, so HP L of M. Um, so this is the subspace, the subspace of function of forms having no uh, components in the multipole expansion. For L tilde greater than L, yeah. So, for example, HP three would only consider you, you would only consider harmonic forms that are um, of degree uh, bigger than four, greater equal four. And in fact, it turns out if you think a little bit about it, I mean the the dimension of um, the dimension of of the space of uh, HP one, for example, can at most be uh, d, I guess, in dimension d because there is not enough space. There are only so and so many harmonic uh, harmonic functions on the sphere. But uh, the Maya Vittori sequence, you can generate uh, as many dimensions as you like by putting tori and obstacles into your region. So in fact, uh, you know, you could, you could actually have harmonic forms that have an extremely high vanishing degree, um, arbitrary high. So this is a non-trivial filtration. And uh, so this distinguishes Example two and example three. 
And that's another theorem that I don't have time to formulate now, but I just wanted to tell you that, you know, this, remember this, you had a one case, you had a wormhole, and in the other case, you had the full torus uh, excluded from the region, and they can be distinguished by also looking at how fast the harmonic forms decay at infinity. And in this case, they, you can actually distinguish them. So it gives you a slightly finer uh, cohomology theory in this context. And the proof works by using the fact that the continuous spectrum is intertwined uh, with the L2 spectrum in, in the way that I explained, uh, maybe not very precisely, but if you want to have more precise information, uh, there is a very long uh, paper that I, even I find very complicated to read uh, available. Okay, so I think that's a good uh, point to stop. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. They are. Thank you very much. Alex, uh, thank you very much uh, yeah. for a wonderful talk. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, if, if you have questions, please unmute yourself uh, and Alex, and so, so, so I wanted to, to ask a question. Uh, uh, how is this related uh, to the results uh, by uh, Graham and Zworski? Which? <laughs> uh, well, uh, <laughs> like scattering on asymptotically hyperbolic. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, the Graham and Swarovski, that's probably uh, funnels, right? Yes. That's not, uh, that's not uh, cusp, cusp, uh, cusps of funnels. And funnels are very similar, of course, indeed, to, to the situation that we consider here. I, I just, I'm not aware um, uh, of, 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 of this kind of intertwining no, no, I think I know how to, okay, sorry, I was a bit blanked out here. So if I'm not mistaken, the spectrum starts at a quarter in two dimensions. And I think in higher dimensions, if you have a hyperbolic structure, it starts at n minus one on squared over four or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so in, the, in, the hyperbolic, in the hyperbolic case, there is a spectral gap. So there, the spectrum, uh, between um, the, the spectrum between the, uh, the so the L2 spectrum, the, the discrete spectrum at zero, and the continuous spectrum are separated by a gap, so you will not have uh, you will not have any overlap between them. I think so that that's a quite different situation, but I'm not sure if I if I know the uh, Graham's work uh, well enough to comment on it to be honest. I mean, uh, this this is what is what is uh, important here is that there is no clear separation between the, the continuous spectrum and the and the L two spectrum, and and I think if you have this uh, curvature, negative curvature, bounded from from uh, from above by something negative, then then there is a spectral gap, and you you immediately have a separation between those two. And I guess another question. So suppose I don't know that you is a very good answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. Suppose you look at high lambda, then uh, you could try to have you know uh, something like a kind of I don't know trace formula or something like uh, for forms on manifolds with boundary, like you know you and Steve and I uh, thought about right in this case. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so there. Are, I should probably say this. I mean, there is a huge amount of literature for for this when lambda goes to infinity, and in fact, uh, I probably can't even list all all the papers that that look at 
for example, the spectral shift function in the case of when lambda goes to infinity. So there are, for example, there are the first thing is probably asymptotic expansions. There is a kind of Weil law when you is that what you mean? Yeah, there, there is a Weil law for when when um, for the spectral shift function as lambda goes to infinity. Uh, that was discovered on various levels of generality. Um, and in fact, uh, you can also prove a trace formula um, and, and Boistermatt Gilliman type formula for for these kind of of manifolds, which then you'd be able to use in a resolvent, sorry, in a in a resonance uh, trace expansion. And I think that uh, you know this is what what Melrose's trace formula essentially is about. Um, that you, you can use these kind of singularity expansions to to say something about resonances. I think that if you Fourier transform the spectral shift function, that probably is basically the difference of the wave traces, and that's been used used before. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm not sure if that answers your, your question. So you said something um, about our paper. Well, I mean, uh, so, so you could, uh, I suppose, you could also look at uh, like the frame flow and. Uh, if you have a boundary and if you have cylindrical ends and things like this. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's an, I think that's an interesting question. So what's the analog of quantum ergodicity in, in this case? Yeah. Mm. So would you use the continuous spectrum? I mean, I think that's more a question for Steve maybe. So would you use the continuous spectrum and, and more like the spectral shift function approach where you have some kind of weighted spectral shift function or would you, would you, would you use the resonances? appropriately normalized in order to do something like that. I don't know. I guess it's a matter of taste. I've thought about that. I've sort of lost you the lost the rest of you. Where did the rest of you go? Do you yeah, see I, I, Steve, I saw your lips moving, but I couldn't hear anything. Do, do you hear me now? Yes, yes. And now I can hear you. Yeah. Just to say a word about that last question. There are several results about the sort of the quantum ergodicity, the continuum eigenfunctions, right? Like Eisenstein's series, as you know, as far yeah. as the resonance, as, as far as the resonance eigenfunctions go, there are no results on it at all. There's several, many people have tried on that one mm -hmm. to prove some kind of quantum ergodicity for the residues of the uh, resonances. Is that what you mean? For example, well, yeah, you have a lot of trouble because you don't even have a vial law. So where do you get started? <laughs> oh, I see. I see. I lost everybody. Where did everybody go? Oh well, uh, I, you. I got you. I got you back again. I think people were muted. That's the thing. No, I lost your pictures, but now I got them back again. Hmm. I have a, I have a, I have a, I'll, I'll just have a, a kind of um, idle question, Alex. What kind of, what, what are the Poincaré duality theorems for these Hodge forms? Can you represent them by cycles? Um, well, I mean, yeah, yes. What are the, the cycles? Yes. What are they? So, I mean, yeah, so the, uh, so there is a boundary, right? So for example, I mean, one of those was cohomology with compact support. Yeah. Um, relative to the boundary. So, they, you must be able to pair them with cycles. So I suppose in this case you will, I, I, because it's recorded, I have to be very careful what I'm saying, right? So I suppose these are cycles which are allowed to end in the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, basically it's, it, you, you just have the same duality theory as, as before, but you just need to make sure that, that well, you're allowed you to pair them. represent them by specific cycles? Well, by specific cycles. I mean, in a way, that's that's the picture I, I I gave you before, right? I mean, I said you know when you have this torus, uh, then there is a certain magnetic field which can come out of this torus, and then I would actually, you know, draw draw circles in the torus. So I guess in a way that's what I, what I was doing. Um, mm. Specific cycles. I mean, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Suppose you just apply the heat operator to the delta functions on these specific cycles and let's see go to infinity. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that, that you would probably converge to one of those. Ah, uh, no, wait a second. So there is also the continuous spectrum, right? So you would converge at a certain rate. Maybe you could do something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Because the, if you put a delta function on the on a cycle, I mean, that's basically gives you a, como, a, a representation in the cohomology class, right? Exactly. Because on a distributional level, that implements the pairing. Right. I guess that's well, what that's you mean. I just said that yeah. I'm basically just taking the harmonic projecting projector on that. Yeah, yeah, but you also have the continuous spectrum, right? So that gives you a very slow, I mean, it, it somehow makes the decay a bit slower. Yeah. And that's also there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, sure, I mean, I, may, I imagine this has been worked out for, I mean, that's probably not so different on a compact manifold. In fact, uh, so the only difference is that it goes faster to, to, to what you expect it to go. Mm. I mean, it, it can draw nice pictures, so I mean, there is, you can compute those 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 harmonic forms, the degrees, but you can actually also say what the electrostatic solutions are that correspond to those things. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so they are, they are, they are cycles. Uh, you can you can draw them. You know whether or not you can draw them always, it's another question. Yeah. Alex and. So besides relative boundary conditions that you were uh, that kind of similar to Dirichlet, there are absolute b boundary conditions which are sort of similar to Neumann uh, for scalar functions, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, so they, uh, how will things change if? Uh, so they, the all results are also valid for absolute boundary conditions for the following reason. You can, if you take a form that satisfies absolute boundary conditions, you apply the Hodge star operator, and then you get a form that satisfies relative boundary conditions and vice I, versa. Ah, okay. And so since you have forms of all degree, you're, you're done. Good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you basically just have to replace n by p minus, uh, n by p by n minus p, and then get the same things for absolute boundary conditions. Okay. Are any of these spaces conformally invariant in some uh, reasonable way, you know, maybe with some, you know, suitable boundary operators put in? Because uh, I know that like for electrodynamics, hmm, I, I don't think know. I mean, in dimension four, I think there is some, two. <laughs> in some dimensions, there is some natural conformal invariance, you know, by, by, uh, by governed runs. You know, so, uh, Anyway, mm -hmm. we can discuss it after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose in dimension two, the thing becomes quite complicated because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank Alex again for a great talk. And uh, next week, uh, there is a special seminar uh, on the occasion of uh, Quillen de Rashvili's birthday. So, uh, uh, Lugunov and Shverak uh, are speaking next Friday. Mm -hmm. So, uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex.